Over the last 24 hours, news from the battlefronts in Ukraine strongly suggest that the Wagner organization has taken control of the center of the central areas of Bakhmut. They've controlled the eastern part of Bakhmut, east of the Bakhmutka River for some time. They captured the Azon plant in the north about a week ago, and it now looks as if they have captured the central districts, the central district of Bakhmut as well. The place where I'm going to make a guess, some of the largest um, apartment buildings and structures in Bakhmut, which have proved so difficult to capture, are probably uh, situated. Anyway, this is the report from TASS, and it quotes Yevgeny Prigozhin, who uh, claims, in fact, he's not just provided claims, he's actually provided pictures of himself with a flag, um, and he claims that presumably that same flag has been unfurled over the um, city administration building in the centre of Bakhmut. And this is what TASS reports him as saying. And I should say this is, comes originally from his own Telegram channel. April 2nd, 2300 hours precisely. Behind me is the building of the city administration. The Russian flag is for Vladlen Tatarsky. I'm going to come to a discussion of Vladlen Tatarsky, a Russian military reporter who has just been assassinated in St. Petersburg. I will come and discuss that later in this program. Anyway, going back to what Prigozhin said, this flag is for Vladlen Tatarsky in grateful memory in grateful memory is written on this flag. Technically, we have captured Bakhmut. Now, notice that he uses the word technically. He is not suggesting that there are not that there are no Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. He's not saying that the entirety of Bakhmut is under Russian control or the Wagner organization's control. Now, I've seen some translations saying that uh, Prigozhin said that Bakhmut is in a legal sense under Russian control with the raising of this flag over the city administration building. The TASS translation, which may be editing a little Prigozhin's words, says that the Russians have technically captured Bakhmut. But as I said, he does allow for the fact that there is still fighting going on in the city. And... Um, We've also had another report, also from TASS, which um, discusses, confirms that um, fighting is still going on in the city. This is from Denis Pushilin, and he said to, TASS reports him as having said to Russia 24 Television, um, the enemy has not received a corresponding order yet to withdraw from Bakhmut, he calls it Artyomovsk. Accordingly, no escape or planned withdrawal of the Ukrainian regime's troops from Artyomovsk is observed. In other words, the Ukrainians are still hanging on, though there's some suggestions, we'll come to that in a moment again, that they've been pushed back to the western districts of this actually relatively small town. And... Um, to discuss what's being said from the Ukrainian side, there's uh, um, an account from um, the um, from um, the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper, and um, it quotes. Um, it, it provides a quotation. Actually, this was given to Reuters by Sergei Cheravati, who is said to be a spokesman of Ukraine's. Eastern Military Command, and Sergei Cheravati says, Bakhmut is Ukrainian and they have not captured anything and are very far from doing it, doing that, to put it mildly. So that <laughs> implies that there's, it implies, but he doesn't actually specifically deny 
that Prigozhin's claim that the city administration building has been captured is untrue. And um, the Guardian goes on to say, there, are no there was no indication from Ukrainian officials that Bakhmut had fallen into Russian hands, and Prigozhin has previously made claims about Wagner's military progress in the city that were premature. The last, by the way, is, so far as I'm aware, not true. I do not remember a single occasion in which Prigozhin has come forward and claimed that <clears throat> his forces, the Wagner forces, have captured territory which turned out to be wrong. I, I have no recollection of anything like that ever happening. It is certainly the case that Ukrainian officials have for weeks denied Russian advances in particular locations. It took them weeks, for example, to finally admit to the loss of Solidar. And of course, recently, the Kiev Independent, whilst discussing the fighting in Avdeyevka, effectively said as much. It said that Ukraine very rarely confirms, or, or is often very slow to confirm, that a particular location has been captured, and that sometimes, but it's captured by the Russians, and that sometimes this kind of confirmation is only provided indirectly when uh, the Ukrainian military speak of fighting going on in a place which would only have been reached by the Russians if they had previously captured another place which Ukraine had previously been defending. But also, I have to point out that The Guardian is being a little bit mischievous for here because, as I said, um, it says that there's no indication from Ukrainian officials that Bakhmut had fallen into Russian hands. But that's not, in fact, what Prigozhin is claiming. Prigozhin is claiming that his troops have captured the city administration building, that they've unfurled their flag there. Perhaps they control the center of Bakhmut. It seems likely that they do. Um, but he's, uh, he's not saying, and has been careful not to say, that the entire town is under Russian control and that there are no Ukrainian troops there. Now, there's been um, other reports from other Ukrainian sources. There's um, War Mapper, which provides maps from a Ukrainian perspective of the state of the fighting. And they do seem to suggest, they do appear to confirm that the city administration building in Bakhmut has indeed been captured by the Russians. But then I would say that I don't know where exactly they're getting this report from. It may be that they're simply taking it from uh, what Prigozhin is saying and from the video that he's accompanied. But there's also been a more detailed report from um, Riba, which is one of the most accurate of um, uh, and reliable of Russian websites covering the war. They have um, various um, reporters or informants on the battlefront, so I'm not entirely clear how Reba works. It's apparently a collective of several war reporters, <clears throat> but Reba has provided a situation report uh, for the state of the Battle of Bakhmut as of 1300 hours, April 3rd, 2023, 1300 hours, that will be local time. In other words, uh, local time in Bakhmut. And it says this, in the north of Bakhmut, a sort of detachment to the Wagner organization continued to advance in the Silesia area to the south of the city. <laughs> that would suggest quite a substantial advance from the north. During the fighting, they completely cleared the territory of school number 24. In addition, <clears throat> Russian units have come close to the railway station. In the central districts of the city, the Wagner forces have gained control of residential areas along Boris Gorbatov Street 
and are, have also established control of the Bakhmut City Administration Building. So that's Rebar saying this, and as I said, they have their own reporters and informants. And as I said, I've never known Prigozhin to claim the capture of something that his forces have not captured, and Rebar appears to confirm anyway that he's, Prigozhin's claim that the Bakhmut City Administration Building has been captured is indeed correct. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, Aribar then goes on to say, now fighting is going on at school number 11 and the clinic. These are presumably still buildings in central Bakhmut, which is still under Ukrainian control. And then it goes on to say, um, over the southern outskirts of the city, um, assault groups continue to expand the zone of control around the avant-garde stadium moving along Bakhmutskaya Street. Now, that is an interesting claim because it refers to the avant-garde stadium, but I have to say straight away that I'm not sure quite what it means, whether they've expanded, the Russians have expanded the area that they control around the avant-garde stadium, which, however, remains under Ukrainian control, or whether it means that the Russians have captured the avant-garde stadium and are expanding their area of control by pushing forward from it. It seems to me it's, this could be interpreted either way. I'm going to assume that the avant-garde stadium is still under Ukrainian control. I would have thought that if it had been captured, there would be a definitive report by now that would confirm as much. And then it goes on to say, the Rebar report goes on to say, at the moment, the armed forces of Ukraine continue to hold the western outskirts of Bakhmut. There are no signs of withdrawal of Ukrainian formations. On the contrary, 80 uh, troops were transferred from the Sunni region, Sumi region to Bakhmut to strengthen positions there. In addition, units of the 5th Assault Brigade, that's of the Ukrainian military, created on the bis, bis basis of the 5th Assault Regiment, that's presumably an airborne unit, or at least originally an airborne unit, have arrived at the section of the chasov ya Khromovo Road. The forces of the 5th Special Forces unit were previously noted only of the, no, sorry of this particular unit were previously noted only in the Toretsk sector. This confirms the plans of the Ukrainian command to continue the defence of Bakhmut. So, clear evidence that the Russians are now making significant progress in Bakhmut. They've captured the city administration building. Prigozhin says it. Riba says it. The uh, official that was quoted by The Guardian, Sergei Cherevati, Ukrainian official, doesn't specifically deny it. It's likely that the central areas of Bakhmut have been largely or perhaps even entirely captured by the Russians, though there do seem to be some holdouts there. Ukrainian troops have been pushed to the western outskirts of the town, but fighting nonetheless goes on, and the Ukrainians continue to put up a resistance, and it's clear that for the moment it is an organized resistance. By the way, there were also some comments about the fighting in Bakhmut from no less a person than President Zelensky, and President Zelensky, in his nightly address yesterday said that I'm grateful to our warriors who are fighting near Avdevka, Marinka, near Bakhmut, especially Bakhmut. It's especially hot there today. And he didn't provide any <laughs> explanation of what he means by that. But I'm not even sure that I like that kind of comment. But anyway, it, it, would, it looks as if the tone of the comment or so it seems to me, suggests a very difficult situation for Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. 
So quite a lot going on and we'll see um, we'll see what goes on over the ne next couple of days but it's clear that for the moment um, the Russians continue to have very much the upper hand in Bakhmut and um, it looks like fighting in Bakhmut is grinding steadily ever further towards its conclusion with the Russians in full control of the town. Now, I say that we still got all those reports about all those Russian, uh, Ukrainian forces concentrated around Bakhmut. There have been rumours, reports, speculations about a Ukrainian counterattack in Bakhmut, either to retake all the lost territory in and around the town or to break the effective siege that the Russians have established in the town. But so far, there's no sign of this counterattack. The Ukrainians seem instead to be focusing principally on trying to keep some kind of opening to Bakhmut from the west. Um, they're still resisting, apparently, in Ivanivska, despite the fact that there were reports yesterday of a heavy Russian assault on this particular village, which sits astride one of the roads leading into Bakhmut. There was an earlier report which says that the Ukraine has actually positioned three brigades in Ivanivska, which gives a sense of how much importance Ukraine gives to control of this particular village. But despite all of that, despite the fact that the Ukrainians are putting up all this resistance, it seems that the Russians, as I said, are gradually pushing through the town. They've either now fully captured or will shortly have fully captured the entire central area of Bakhmut. They will at that point, I presume, control around, what, 80% of the town? And Ukraine will still be holding out in some areas in the west. But as I said, it's increasingly looking as if the fighting in Bakhmut is going the Russians' way. And there have been more reports, by the way, about fighting in other places. There's been fighting apparently intensifying in Marinka. Marinka is part of the um, Marinka Vugleda uh, battle, the two towns, the fighting in the two towns is connected to each other. It seems generally acknowledged that if one of these places, um, Marinka specifically perhaps, is captured, then Ukrainian positions in Vugledar <clears throat> will become, well, if not untenable, they come under very heavy pressure. Whereas if Vugledar is captured, then Ukrainian resistance at Marinka will become unsustainable because Ukraine receive, sends its supplies to Marinka via Vugledar. Now, the situation in Vugledar for some time has been at a standstill. The Russians made a big push on Vugledar in January, but they were unable to storm the town, um, which is um, easily defended. It's got very high buildings, a little bit like Bachmann. So they seem to have focused instead on Marinka. And as I said, there's been intense fighting going on in Marinka for months. And I remember, I recall that at one point back in the autumn, the Russians even claimed that they'd captured the place, which turned out to be premature. But anyway, regardless of that, there seems to have been another major advance by the Russians or major push by the Russians in Marinka. And I get the impression that the extent of Ukrainian control in Marinka is now reducing to what might very well become before very long unsustainable levels. Now, if Marinka falls, as I said, Ukraine's position in Vugledar becomes very difficult. Now, I should say that in this part of the battlefronts, there's been 
a rotation of Russian commanders. The previous long-standing Russian commander in this area, General Muratov, has been <laughs> um, relieved and has been replaced by a new commander who is apparently a rather uh, straightforward character, apparently popular with the soldiers. He might have been brought in because there was feelings that General Muratov bungled the capture of Vugladar in January and that it was time for somebody to come in and bring a fresh mind to the matter. I would say that Muratov has previously had a pretty good reputation. He was apparently a rather effective commander of the peacekeeping forces in the southern Caucasus, in the Azerbaijan-Armenia uh, conflict area. Uh, but apparently in this particular battle, he's proved less successful. And it may be that this latest advance in Marinka is in some way connected to rotation of commanders. And there's been Russian missile strikes on Konstantinovka, another town in this general area, uh, not far from Bakhmut, in fact, about 27 kilometers away from Bakhmut. And um, um, there's also accumulating reports now of more and more Russian airstrikes carried out principally by Suhoi 35, 34 bombers. And they seem to be um, launching uh, these very big, very powerful, precision-guided, glided bombs, gliding bombs on various positions, targeting and seeking to destroy Ukrainian defence lines. Now, I should say, Brian Boletic at the New Atlas has done a very interesting video um, discussing the effectiveness of gliding, these gliding bombs, 1,500 kilo bombs. So these are very, very big bombs. You imagine a 1,500 kilo bomb is going to pack far more exp explosive than a shell launched, for a single shell from a tubed artillery piece can, can do. And of course, some months ago, I had a very interesting email. In fact, it was actually a series of emails from an Indian um, viewer, an, a viewer from India who served in the Indian military, but who's also got very extensive background in engineering and technology issues. <laughs> extremely extensive, uh, who pointed out to me that if you really want to break fortified positions quickly, the best way to do it is with gravity bombs. They're much bigger. They make a far bigger explosive charge. They will um, strike fortifications where they're most vulnerable and that... The fact that the Russians have been deterred from using their air force to bomb Ukrainian fortifications because of the very extensive air defense system that Ukraine inherited from the Soviet Union, that that has been a major factor in slowing uh, the Russian advance in the war and is the single most important reason why the Russians have had to fight it in this very incremental attritional way. And this is also, of course, something that was discussed extensively, very extensively yesterday by Brian Boletic. And he's pointed out that the fact that the Russian Air Force is now becoming more active, more active in Avdevka and Bakhmut, by the way, but also increasingly um, in areas in northern Ukraine, like in Sumy, region where they've been launching bomb attacks as well, as I discussed in another program, suggests that the long campaign that the Russians launched or started back in October with their missile strikes on Ukrainian energy facilities has had at least, has achieved at least one of its purposes or largely achieved one of its purposes, which is to deplete 
Ukraine's air defense system to the point where it's finding it more difficult to counter Russian aircraft, uh, Russian fight, uh, bomber jet, bombers as they carry out bombing raids over um, locations, strategic locations in Ukraine. And of course, if the Russian Air Force is able to operate more actively, launch more of these bomb attacks, then Russian advances will accelerate. Now, I think at this point it's worth making one quick point, which is, of course, that the United States is the country with the greatest experience and expertise in precision-guided bomb technology. It pioneered this technology. Um, well, it didn't actually pioneer this technology. The Germans did during the Second World War. But at least the United States was the first to adopt this technology on a big scale in the 1960s using precision-guided bombs for the first time in the last stages of the Vietnam War. It used them very extensively in the 1991 uh, war against Iraq. And it has a very large armory of these bombs. The US may be short of artillery shells. It may have difficulty producing artillery shells. It may have difficulty keeping up with demand of high Mars rockets. It has no shortage of bombs, even of the very expensive and complex precision guided bombs. And it is intending to supply some of these bombs to Ukraine. And the reason it would presumably want to do that is because the Russians have built up these enormous fortifications in the south of Ukraine, in the southern regions of, well, they don't say it's Ukraine, in Zaporozhye region, in the area blocking the Ukrainian proposed Ukrainian offensive, and in the north, in the Kremenaya Svatovo area, where um, Ukraine had launched, or had been planning to launch, an offensive in, in the autumn, following upon its successful offensive in the Kharkov region, but where, in fact, it was fought to a standstill, and where the Russians, in recent weeks, have regained the initiative. Now, there is, however, a problem <laughs> about using these precision-guided bombs, JDAM bombs, that the United States intends to supply to Ukraine. And in an interesting way, these were highlighted, though indirectly, by Brian Boletic's program, which is that, of course, the reason the Russian Air Force is, be is becoming much more active now and is able to start dropping these bombs incre with increasing frequency and increasing effectiveness on Ukrainian defences along the front lines is because Ukraine's air defence system built around the S-300 missiles, as I said, bequeathed to the U to Ukraine by the Soviet Union, its air defense system has now become very severely depleted. And of course, its air force has become depleted as well. <laughs> For Ukraine to launch bomb attacks of the same kind on Russian fortifications in Zaporozhye region and in the Svatovo Kremenaya area would be much more difficult and far more dangerous. The reason is that the Russian air defense system, which, to be clear, is much more extensive and far more sophisticated than Ukraine's ever was, is, of course, fully functioning. And the Russians have all their various very long-range missiles, the S-400, the S various iterations of the S-300 system. They're all operating there on the battlefronts, and they absolutely do have the reach 
to shoot down any Ukrainian aircraft that come heavily laden with these kind of bombs and attempt to approach these fortified positions at the very high altitudes at which these sort of bombs are released. And of course, if the aircraft try to fly lower, the Russians have an enormously dense air defense system um, with multiplicities of um, shorter range um, missiles and guns that they can also use to shoot down um, Ukrainian aircraft that fly closer to the Russian fortified lines. And again, this is immeasurably more dense than anything that Ukraine has or which the West can supply to Ukraine. And of course, and this is not to overlook the fact that Russia also operates a far more powerful air force than Ukraine. Most Russian, many of these Russian fighter jets like the Sukhoi 35, the Sukhoi 57 and the MiG-31 have very long range, extremely long range air to air missiles. They have been used very effectively to shoot down Ukrainian aircraft. To be frank, I think it would be exceptionally difficult for the Ukrainians to reproduce what the Russians are now starting to do and to use precision guided bombs to attack Russian fortified lines. Anyway, that's the situation on the battlefronts. Yesterday, the big news in Russia was not the raising of the flag over the city administration building in Bakhmut. It was the murder of Vladlen Tatarsky, um, a um, person from the Donbass who's fought in the uh, Donbass militia. He's been an active fighter since 2014, the fighting in 2014. And um, he's also been, well, the Western media calls him a blogger. The Ukrainians and some parts of the Western media called him a propagandist. I would call him a war reporter. I've read his reports from time to time. Obviously, they reflect his very passionate loyalties to the Donbass cause, which is one reason, by the way, why I've tended to use them less in my own discussions. But anyway, he was a reporter. He did provide his views of what was happening. And of course, he was a combatant as well. And he was killed in St. Petersburg, where he was attending an event. And a young woman, who has, by the way, now been arrested, um, gave him a statuette at this particular event. And the statuette contained a bomb, and the bomb exploded, and he was killed. And importantly, this is a crowded event in a cafe. Quite a few other people were injured as well. Now, I'm going to say straight away, I think this is an appalling act. I think it was a deeply shocking, horrible act um, of murder in a civilian city. There's no indication. I've never seen any indication that the Russians have ever tried to do anything similar in any city in Ukraine under Ukrainian control. I've never heard of them infiltrating people to try and murder people in that kind of a way. It, on the battle lines, people, of course, die, and it is a terrible thing. But in the rear, in this fashion, well, I've never known the Russians to do that. Now, this investigation is at its early stages. The young woman who gave the statuette to Tatarsky has been arrested and appears to be cooperating at least to some extent with the Russian law enforcement authorities. She comes from a 
activist background. She has she attended anti-war rallies in St. Petersburg in February 2022. She belongs, as does her husband, by the way, who is in the West, where he went to avoid the um, um, conscription, the mobilization. Anyway, they both belong to a party which has previously provided support to the Russian dissident politician and blogger Alexei Navalny. There's no reason to doubt at all that she has strong or has had strong um, pro-Ukrainian, pro-Western, anti-Putin sympathies. Of that, I don't think there's any doubt at all. But there is serious questions and very great doubts about what her exact role in this um, murder actually was. And it seems that she agreed, or so she says, to work for a group of people whom she took to be Ukrainian journalists. And they employed her apparently as a courier, amongst other things. And according to what appears to be her account, she delivered this parcel to Tatarsky, Mr. Tatarsky, without knowing what it contained. In which case, I would say, by the way, she is completely innocent of any crime. Now, I have to say that that is her account. And it is important to not to second guess it at this stage. Let me reiterate, anybody charged with any kind of criminal offence must be presumed innocent until they're proved guilty. And on balance, I have to say, I find her account a plausible one. Um, it's not inconceivable, perhaps, that she did know what she was doing, but it's also, I think, hardly implausible that she was used by whoever it was who did carry out who was responsible for carrying out this murder. Now, the Western media is full of speculations that this was an internal feud within the Russian political system. Um, Tatarsky is said to be close to um, Prigozhin, and Prigozhin has had a difficult relationship, to put it mildly, with the minister with the Ministry of Defence, the Russian Ministry of, Def Ministry of Defence, and the Daily Telegraph, for example. Its reporter, one of its reporters, Roland Oliphant, is making some really, I think, quite extraordinary claims that the Russian Defence Ministry murdered, might have murdered Tatarsky as some kind of a warning to Prigozhin. I find that an absolutely fantastical idea, I <laughs> have to say. I haven't seen a scintilla of evidence to support it. I think it is almost certainly, in fact, I'm absolutely sure that it is completely wrong. Wrong to the point of being absurd. I think that certainly at a time like this, in, at a time of war, the Russian Ministry of Defence is not going to be organising the assassination of people who are close to one of Russia's most important commanders, if one can call Prigozhin a commander, or at least he's playing a, he certainly plays a pivotal role in the operations of the Wagner Group. I can't imagine that the Russian Defence Ministry would be doing anything of that kind. And for the record, I can't recall an instance when it's been proved that the Russian Ministry of Defence has ever at any time acted in that way. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the US essentially confirmed that the murder of Daria Dugina, 
the daughter of Alexander Dugin, the Russian intellectual and philosopher and Eurasianist who was murdered, Daria Dugina was murdered in Moscow, that that murder was the work of Ukraine special services. So Ukraine, according to the United States, has done this sort of thing. And I can't help but think that they must be the obvious suspect. The Russian law enforcement authorities say that they are. And though, as I said, at this stage, this is still only in investigation, that must be the operating hypothesis. I do find it extraordinary. I do find it absolutely bizarre at this present time that Western journalists, Western reporters, Western commentators, seeing incidents like this, seeing like incidents like the Tatarsky killing, instead of straightforwardly condemning it, condemning the murder of a man, maybe not, you know, a man who is uninvolved in the war, but anyway, murdering the murder of a man um, in a peaceful city, in a cafe, with large numbers of civilians around, some of them were injured as a result of a bomb, that Western reporters and commentators, instead of condemning this act, or at least criticising this act, come up with speculations about it, far-fetched speculations about it, trying to distance Ukraine from it, speculations, as I said, which are unfounded on any conceivable evidence, and say things about the murdered man, that he was a propagandist and a blogger, and pointing to his previous criminal record, which he undoubtedly did have um, at a moment of this kind. I mean, I find that very, very strange. I get to choose my words extremely carefully at this point. And I would say that perhaps the people who write in this way should take a step back and think about what they're doing. After all, I would point out that when murders are committed in Western capitals, which Western journalists attribute to the Russians, Litvinenko, Skripal, spring to mind, well, their approach, their commentary about those murders is very different. And though you can, if you want, focus on differences between those murders and Tatarskis, I personally think and that's a pointless exercise and a mistaken approach to take. Anyway, this murder of Tatarsky and the way it's been covered, and I should say, for me personally, it is the way it's been covered that is the most troubling aspect of this affair, the way it's been covered in the West, is also consistent with some another incident which has gathered extensive media headlines. And this is the events at the Pachorsky um, uh, uh, Lavra in Kiev. It's one of the major religious centers of orthodoxy in this part of the world. Um, and of course, as many people have been, and I'm sure all of you, my viewers have been aw are aware, the Ukrainian government has been trying to gain control of this building, expelling the Orthodox monks who have been based there. Now, I have to say again that the way in which this has been reported in the West has been astonishing. There have been one or two minor critiques. There's been some rather mumbled words of well, criticism. Well, I don't think they're anywhere near strong enough from the Pope. But generally speaking, most of the media 
reporting that I've seen of this attempt to seize control of this of a lavra and to expel the monks in the West has been supportive of what the Ukrainian government has been doing. I've been reading things like, you know, that the lavra is a centre of Russian activity or of even of spying, which I have to say, given that it's a monastic <laughs> building, does seem a rather far-fetched idea. I would also say, by the way, that when it comes to monks in the past, during the Second World War, Western pilots who were shot down, especially over Italy, um, sometimes did find refuge in monastic institutions, Catholic monastic institutions. And, well, the fact that they were there was pretty well pretty much known to the Italian and German authorities. But they didn't, they showed some understanding of the fact that it would at least be open them to criticism if they entered those monastic institutions, which as a result preserved themselves. But in Ukraine, apparently, the Ukrainian government is able to enter monastic institutions try to drive out the monks, and it comes in for very little criticism indeed. Now, I am, by practice and belief, an Orthodox Christian. I found this a very difficult story, so difficult that I have, up to now, avoided discussing it. So I'm not going to say much more other than to say that those who are sitting back letting this happen, perhaps quietly cheering it on, well, I leave it to them to decide for themselves how that is consistent with their principles and beliefs and consciences. Anyway, let's move on and to talk about other things. Now, um, there's been a certain amount of news on the economic front. I say a certain amount of news, a very important piece of news, actually, which is that um, a group of major oil producers led by Saudi Arabia have now also announced significant cuts in oil production. Saudi Arabia announced a unilateral cut of oil production of half a million barrels a day. Various other Gulf producers have joined. So have some of the Central Asian states, I expect that there will be, before long, a full decision by OPEC backing an earlier decision by Russia also to cut oil production. And this is, in aggregate, going to be a significant cut in oil production of, well, well over one million barrels a day. And already it's had an effect on oil prices, which have been pushing upward. Now, the price of oil has been sliding in recent weeks, but I think most people expect that if the West avoids recession, which I have to say uh, is doubtful, but most people think that if the West avoids recession, with the Chinese economy now firing on all cylinders, um, there's been a marked expansion in the Chinese economy over the last um, few months since China fully reopened after the pandemic, after, the, after its pandemic restrictions. Most people have been expecting that oil prices would go up. Anyway, so why have the Saudis done this? Well, I think that there is a very straightforward explanation. And I think, by the way, it goes to the core of the collapse in the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States. And I think what has infuriated the Saudis is that the United States, or at least the Biden administration, 
is still making efforts to push down oil prices. And it's doing so through various means. Firstly, there were those oil price caps that were imposed on Russian oil products that came into force earlier this year, these G7 caps. And then there were the releases from the United States' strategic reserve, which President Biden has been undertaking ever since oil prices started to rise. And he's continuing to do it. He's been doing it even when oil prices have fallen back. He's still releasing um, oil from the United States' strategic reserve, even though that has now become depleted to the levels that it last had in the mid to early 1980s. And I think that the Saudis, who are, of course, one of the three major oil producers and also one of the two key oil exporters are not happy <laughs> with the fact that the United States is trying to control and push downward the price of their product. And I think that more than any other single thing, it is this policy of the Biden administration to interfere in the oil market, to try to push prices down when they go up, and even more outrageously, to push prices further down when they go down, which explains the antagonism between Saudi Arabia and the Biden administration that has emerged over the last few months. And I get to say further that I think that this has united the Saudi princes behind uh, the Crown Prince, <coughs> Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> who's not always had an easy relationship with some of the Saudi princes up, uh, uh, until now, and who also, however, has had his own personal reasons, going back to the Khashoggi affair, of being less than sympathetic to liberal opinion in the United States, and to the Biden administration in particular. So it is, again, very extraordinary that the United States, or at least the Biden administration, seems blind to this reality, that they don't seem to grasp that taking this action of trying constantly to push down oil prices is inevitably going to sour the US relationship with its key Arab ally. Its key ally, not just in the Middle East, but historically, going all the way back to the 1970s, in balancing the oil market, keeping oil prices under control, and also buttressing the reserve currency status of the dollar. It's, again, I can't help but think, a further example of the way in which the Biden administration is over overwhelmingly focused on two things. Firstly, on trying to hurt Russia, or trying to artificially push down oil prices, the Biden administration, I think, continues to believe that Russia is just a gas station masquerading as a country, and that if oil prices fall, fall far enough, that will somehow bankrupt Russia and provide, prevent Russia from continuing its operation in Ukraine. I think that's one obsession. 
And I think the other obsession is that the United States, the, the Biden administration, is more than almost any other administration I have known, determined to preserve itself politically, worried very much about the risk of a return to power by the Republicans and indeed by Donald Trump. And as a result, it's anxious to keep oil prices down, even as it continues its sanctions policy against Russia. So I think that in all of this, the administration is showing utter blindness to Saudi concerns. And I think that this is now starting to have a practical effect. We see the Saudis now completing a major package of agreements with China, economic agreements with China. They've agreed to re-establish diplomatic relations with Iran. They've brokered, they let the Chinese broker a rapprochement between themselves and Iran. They are now apparently intending to invite the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad to the next Arab League summit meeting, thereby fully reintegrating Syria into the Arab world, taking all of these steps, but most importantly, and above all else, they're now increasingly shifting away from their historic position of only selling oil for dollars. So they've done deals with China. Apparently, they're in the process of negotiating a similar huge deal with India. They will sell in India oil in return for payment in rupees. And that's Indian currency, rupees. And of course, the Russians are doing the same. They're selling India oil for rupees. The ruble rupee trade is now up and running. And of course, with Saudi Arabia, gradually integrating itself into the Eurasian system. It's joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a kind of candidate member. It's apparently intending to join the BRICS. I can't help but think that all of these arrangements to accept payments in national currencies are preparatory, they form a transitional phase before the introduction of the BRICS reserve currency in which the Saudis obviously want to play a role. So all of this is going on and the Saudis, instead of perhaps being wary of it as they might have been in former times, when they were the US's ally, they're now embracing it. They are actively helping all of these countries, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, all the rest. They're pressing on with the helping these countries in setting up this alternative trading and currency architecture independent of and separate from the dollar. And this last decision, as I said, to cut oil production is just another example of this. Now, on the topic of oil, I think that it's now becoming increasingly clear as well that we are looking at essentially a disintegrated oil market. And what's becoming very interesting is that today, another big Asian economy basically announced or confirmed that it was breaking away from the United States in terms of the oil sanctions policy that has been imposed on Russia. And that economy, that country is Japan. Now, Japan is a member of the G7. As a member of the G7, 
It was one of the countries that formally agreed to Janet Yellen's oil price cap idea last autumn. I was always sceptical about the viability of the oil price cap. It's clear that it has never had much traction on Asian markets. Japan, which is a major economy in the, in the Asian system, has decided that it has to import oil and gas from Russia. There's no option but to do that in order to sustain its economic viability. And it has informed the United States that it is going to buy oil from Russia above the cap. In other words, it's opted out of the G7 oil price cap. And apparently, the Japanese told the United States that that was what they were going to do. But in order to try to sugar the pill, or soften the blow, if you like, it was agreed that this would be done face saving, but through a face saving formula, the United States and the other G7 states would grant Japan a waiver from the oil price cap. Japan would be able to buy oil from Russia above the oil price cap, and the United States and the other G7 states would allow it to do so. Now, what that means is that the other big Asian economy, the three biggest Asian economies, are China, India, and Japan. All three of these Asian economies are now bought by oil and gas from Russia, and they are not observing the oil price cap. There's another point to bear in mind as well. If we're talking about the G7, Japan, as a nation, as a state, has the biggest single economy in the G7 after the United States itself. So even within the G7, the second biggest economy has, in effect, defected from the United States over this issue of the oil price cap. The oil price cap is in effect collapsing. The US remains largely self-sufficient in oil, so it can just, buy, just about get by, uh, pretend to abide by it, and it's not unduly affected. The people who are continuing to observe this oil price cap are the European Union, <laughs> except, of course, that even they are now buying oil from Russia at premium prices through third parties, and they know that they're doing it. Rarely has a policy failed so completely and so quickly. On the topic of Japan, I'm going to say something else. When Xi Jinping visited Moscow and had his meeting, his big meeting with um, Vladimir Putin, creating what the British um, commentator and former diplomat Alistair Cook calls the new, day, the new Entente. That's one way of describing this relationship between China and Russia. Why not, in fact? Um, anyway, whilst Xi Jinping was in Moscow, the Japanese Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kishida, went off and had a meeting in Kiev with Zelensky. And, of course, a lot of people, I remember, were saying, well, this is, you know, this is countering the moves that the Chinese were making. The Chinese are going to, <laughs> to Moscow, but China's big Asian rival, it's going to Kiev instead. 
I think this revelation that the Japanese have just torn up the oil price gap provides us with the true explanation of why Kishida went to Kiev to meet Zelensky. I think he went to, to Kiev because this was part of the quid pro quo <laughs> for the agreement, the, ja the agreement by the US and the other G7 for J Japan, in effect, to walk out of the oil price cap. The Japanese said, well, if you let us get out of this cap, we're going to do all kinds of nice things for you. We'll give you more support for Taiwan and all that sort of thing. And we're going to go to Kiev as well. And we're going to meet Zelensky. And we're going to have a meeting there. We'll be there before the cameras. So uh, Xi Jinping will be in Moscow meeting Putin. But we will be in Kiev meeting Zelensky. And I think that was the explanation for that really rather strange visit, which, to be honest, I didn't really, couldn't really very much make very much sense of. Well, money talks. Sometimes it talks more loudly than words do. Sometimes very much more loudly. And we see that in this particular case, Japan has talked more loudly with its money than it did with its words. Because, of course, even as Japan, as its prime minister, went to Kiev, it was agreeing to buy oil from the Russians at a price higher than the oil price cap. I would just say this. Prime Minister Kishida does need to be very careful about visiting Kiev and appearing to get too close to Z Zelensky. My colleague and friend at the Duran, Alex Christoforou, has coined the expression the Zelensky, or he prefers to say the Elensky curse. Anybody, any political leader who gets too close to President Zelensky, let's say has a drastically shortened, or appears to have a drastically shortened political life. So we've seen Boris Johnson of Britain, he's no longer Prime Minister. Draghi of Italy has also gone, all sorts of other people have gone as well. And now, of course, the Prime Minister of Finland, Prime Minister Marin, who of course was the person who committed Finland 100%, 150% to support for Ukraine, who reversed Finland's historic and once popular and extremely successful policy of neutrality, who reversed and ended Finland's formerly close and even friendly relations with its giant neighbour, Russia. Anyway, Prime Minister Marin has just lost an election in Finland in which she came third. Well, she's apparently still personally popular and it was a very hard fought election and the three parties um, of which, as I said, her party came third. Well, if you look at the actual votes the number and percentage of the votes, they're all very close to each other. So saying that she came her party came third is perhaps a bit hard. But nonetheless, the fact is, she's not going to be Prime Minister of Finland. And one wonders whether perhaps that's uh, something which others might want to take cognizance of before they get too close to Zelensky in Kiev. One other person might be starting to worry about the same thing, and that is Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. Now, I believe she still has some time still as president of the European Commission, but reports were circulating yesterday 
that she's now decided to uh, move from her office in one building in Brussels to an office in another building in Brussels. She has decided, apparently, to apply for the post of Secretary General of NATO. Now, there's some scepticism about whether she'll get it. The British apparently are unhappy because they feel that she was an utterly incompetent defence minister in Germany who allowed the German military to run down to the deplorable state that it's in. Though it must be said, bad defence minister though she was, she was only the latest in a succession of German defence ministers who have allowed that, kind, that particular situation to arise. But anyway, it seems that the British are sceptical. But it also seems that there is a possibility that she might get the role. Because apparently, though the British are sceptical and unhappy, they're not prepared to veto her if the other NATO countries support her nomination. And the person who for a while appeared to be the front runner, Christia Freeland of Canada, is now said to be, for reasons I don't know and don't understand, but she's said to be unacceptable to the United States. The US has apparently signaled that he doesn't want to see Christa Freeland as NATO Secretary General. So it could be that Ursula von der Leyen has concluded that it may be less than a good idea to remain President of the European Commission for much longer. And so she's decided to transfer to the safer post, which is Secretary General of NATO instead. Maybe she too fears the onset of the Elensky curse and is looking for a bolt hole before it comes. Just guessing. Who's to say? Anyway, that's me for the day. More from me soon. Uh, lots of things obviously going on on the Ukrainian battlefronts. No doubt there'll be more information about the Tatarsky murder as well. And in the meantime, all that remains is for me to wish all of you a good day and to remind you that you can find all our videos on our various channels, or platforms rather, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, um, Rockfin and Telegram, that you can also uh, support our work by going to Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video, and by going to our shop and buying the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Well, that's me for the day, more from me soon, and have a very good day.